I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. Talking about a metronome and all that. <laughs> that, oh, that gave me a fantastic idea that will never happen. Uh, so who's the guy that mumbles from King of the Hill? Boomhauer, uh, fuck? What's that? Where is this file? Uh oh. Uh, give me a minute. Can do. What file are you uh, looking for? Uh, the file of the thing that I just. I did research on last night. My drive. Wikipedia research. Ready for broadcast. Okay, well, I think I still have it. Where did I even save that? Like, it was on my list I of recent files. Don't no, I think you can sort from the top level file folder tree for like all your files, and you can sort them by uh, date last fiddled with. Okay. I had to do that once because I thought I lost something. I also, oh, which one was it? It was, uh, where is it? It was episode. One of our very early episodes. So one of the bad ones. I lost a significant portion of my audio track. Yeah. So then I had to re-record. <laughs> Which I don't remember that. <laughs> you couldn't tell. I did a very good job because I, I really, it. like, basically sat with my back to everything and was just reacting again the way uh, to your stuff. And I could also tell by your reactions what I would have been saying. Oh, God. <sighs> There's a part of me that feels really upset about that because that makes <laughs> me feel like our our conversations are more or less predictable. Oh, no, they're not. Like, a, like so it, it, it was two takes. It was a take of me doing genuine reactions and then putting in markers whenever you didn't react to what I thought I said. But I could tell by what your response was, what oh, I, exactly okay. it was that I said. And then <laughs> it was it was a nightmare. Yeah, it sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, it was, was... It was. It was in one of the first four episodes. <laughs> and then guess, guess when I started uploading all of my uh, uh, and, and saving uh... copies of all the voice tracks well, to guess, uh, the Google Drive. <laughs> I guess that explains why that started happening. Oh, boy. Ugh. I was wondering why you were doing that for a while. Yeah, no, it, it's because I uh, lost some data, and then I did a, a system restore to a date I knew that I had it. But oh. Windows, when you do a full system restore, God. doesn't save media files. That's terrible. Like, it was... I put a significant portion of work trying to to recover that file, doing like you know restore full, like whole system to a previous state and all that. Lisa was asking about the PS4. What what game is she playing? Uh, Dark Cloud Two, I believe. Okay, cool. Right, um, Dark Cloud Two, right, Lisa? Yeah. Um, also, so so when you when you mumbled before, I was thinking, what if Boom Howard did uh, that Kid Rock song? Bow what to bow, ba dang it, I diggy diggy. Boom Howard didn't do that Kid Rock song? I guess not. I also had a very weird dream last night. Okay, so dreams are always the most, the best thing to listen to. Dre so let's no, do no. it. It's legit. So one, I knew I was dreaming in the dream, but couldn't do anything about it. Because I was okay. like, huh, this is weird. But it was a zombie dream. So I was, I was outdoors, which one, that's a bad move. But mm -hmm. there were zombies. But here's the thing. Zombies weren't dead people bitten by zombies. Zombies were just violent, irrational people that you had to hide from. Okay. Well, yeah. There's a few. There's a few jokes that I'll make, but it might alienate some of our listeners, so I won't make them. <laughs> <laughs> that and then uh, I lived for the whole dream, mm -hmm. um, but then there was a groundhog that almost fucked everything up because I I had 
a a super dope camouflage tent and uh but then there's a groundhog kind of like pawn at the outside so i kept like flicking at it like get out of here get shoot scram scram and then there there was there were two other people they were whole cloth fabrications of the mind and they were just unhelpful i mean you always have to have at least one unhelpful person in a zombie apocalypse scenario and that person is john (laughs) <laughs> well no that like i found them and i was like oh dope okay you guys seem rational and then they just wouldn't talk and then they ran away and i was like come on this that's is amazing. the worst this is the worst that's very good it, it was it was a hell <laughs> oh it's man just irrational people and, and people that are of no help <laughs> it's... my uh my dreams are usually just nightmares, uh, like shapeless voids that I can never really pin, pin anything down. Yeah. So that's fun. Oh, I n- usually never remember them, but this one was particularly interesting. Describe me, it did no justice. It was a whole, so it wasn't like that blown out Walking Dead feel. It was like a Romero esque kind of feel uh, to it. Okay. And okay, the other yeah. thing was, um, I was actually literally about to ask. The outdoor area was a. A, because I was looking around at all the geographical features, and I was like, "Oh, this is clearly these several areas from when I was growing up, but mm-hmm. just sort of blended together to fit within the like essentially one block area where the dream actually took place." So I was like, "Man, I was like this. I was like, this is pretty cool. They did a good job. That that tree's from my my grandmother's neighbor, and it's here. It fits that, but it doesn't necessarily fit with the geometry over here. It was cool. I was." I was sort of analyzing the dream within itself, but then also had to avoid the violent and irrational people. That's that's kind of wild. Was this like a <laughs> REM state dream, or was this like one of those like twilight states? You know, when you're about to wake up. You know. Oh no, I, I was full about. blown sleeping. Okay, Sleep so sleeping. it was like a full on REM. Yeah. That's kind of wild. Uh, it was it was fun when it lasted, and then after a point, I was like, man, I just sort of want to wake up because this is this is just uh. tedious. They, they became to be a lot of tedium because it's sort of like, I wonder how well my brain uh, replicated that feature over there. But then there's a violent, irrational person. So I guess I won't get to check that out. Yeah. I mean, most dreams are just efforts in tedium. Yeah. Um, also, most zombie apocalypses, when there's not moments of pure terror, it's a lot of boring shit. Yeah, it was mostly boring shit. Yeah, I mean that's what happens. You know, you gotta, you got you gotta boil water. You gotta make sure you have food. You can't go to the supermarket because that's where all the fucking zombies are. Yeah, unless I mean, it's more like Fido. Fido. Uh, which one was Fido? Fido was the one that that the they owned the pet zombies, right? Yeah, they had they had the pet zombies, and then Fido was one of the like the main pet zombie, and then I guess they had him on like a game show for a little bit. I remember you really into that ga- that movie in like high school. Yeah, it was the, a fun um, one. It, it's all that's also kind of like the end of uh, Shaun of the Dead. Then, yes, yeah, yeah. So I think the end of Shaun of the Dead might have been, um, not comping, but sort of like saying like, here's an homage to another zombie movie that we all really like and thought that it'd be worth making people go, oh yeah, that thing. Oh, um, I finally saw. That reminds me, I finally saw uh, Into the Spider-Verse. Okay. And What's that? <laughs> you don't know Into the... You don't know that? No. It's the Spider-Man movie. It's got Miles oh. Morales as the main character. Okay. I, and, I don't know them as, like, in titles. I'm just like, oh, it's the... Uh, it's the animated Spider-Man movie. The one that... Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Was it good? It was phenomenal. Right on. Um, it was like an it was weird because it was an origin story, but it didn't feel like an origin story. Yeah, because um, it's basically Miles Morales' origin story. Because, I mean, most people who don't read the comics are not as familiar with Miles Morales. I feel like. Yeah. Um, or if you play the Insomniac game, you'll know who Miles Morales is as well. But, mm-hmm. um, it, it, I think it's more or less a introduction to the character for the general audience. Okay. So they can start doing stuff with him. Because he's yeah. actually a really cool character. Cool. And they right also on. introduced to general audiences Spider Gwen. Mm-hmm. Um, who's Spider easy- Gwen. Spider Gwen is easily one of my favorite Marvel characters. Because she's like, what if Gwen Stacy was the one who got bit by the spider? Yeah. 
and it's pretty dope. Oh, Spider Gwen's awesome. Oh, what are you doing? <sighs> so, what's this episode about, Brandon? Because I saw episode... posts about it. Oh, that's that's part two. So, so okay. Uh, uh... Oh, another two parter. No, no, no. The second half of the first uh, of the the one copy. Okay. So it's sort of a here's the typical, and then here's the atypical. Is is how that's broken out. Cat, let me just move this real quick. I have um, cases of guitar picks, and the cats when they try to look out the window hop on top of the pile of cases of guitar picks and knock them all down, and they have to put them all back. And mm-hmm. it's uh, it's annoying because none of them are cheap. They're that, yeah, that's that's pretty much uh. It's pretty much cats. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my go-to, my typical one's a $10 pick, and then I've got a bunch of those, and I've got a couple that are like $70, $80. $80 picks? Yeah, they're made from a a, a, a thermoplastic that's used in um, the ball bearings of racing yachts. But the, the nice thing about them is that they don't wear down. So you essentially buy the one, and as long as you don't lose it, you have it. Um so and they also don't chirp when you hit them on the string. So there, there's um, there, there, there's just less you have to take care of if you're trying to record with them. So here's my question for you. Yes. Because I'm an ignorant dumbo. Yes. Um. What? Where, where are their ball bearings in a racing yacht? In the uh... wheels. <laughs> because i mean I, I assume that it's in the the jig for the sale but i i don't know so the manufacturer tells you like this is why we're charging this much is because the material is expensive and it's used in the bearings of racing yachts and I, I forget what the material is but using that information um and my job which involves a lot of being given very little information and needing to find very specific stuff, I did find that material and found its cost per, if you were to order blocks of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it seemed like it was actually a reasonable price. Okay. Um, I forget what it was. But for the listeners who are like, huh, there's Bigfoot on this icon. Uh, welcome no, to there's, Crypto. <laughs> there's nothing about cryptids in this podcast. I no, don't know the... why people listen to this podcast. <laughs> it's not about cryptids. Oh. Turn around. Go away. Yeah, it's uh, Welcome to Cryptopedia. It is an exploration of the myths and legends that haunt the human mind. Each week, we will take you on a journey exploring the mysteries of the world, tackling tales of monsters, folklore, and the paranormal, and that thing that definitely lives under your bed. I'm Brandon. I'm John, and his name is Bob. Bob? Bob that's the Big the name. That's the name of the thing that lives under your bed. Oh, there's... Okay, that could throw me in a whole tangent, so I won't. Um, yeah. Just look up the Princess uh, books by Patrick Rothfuss. It's fantastic. It's kids' books for adults. If you read them to a kid, it's all like a happy book. If you have the context of the world as an adult, it's a horrifying book. And it's fantastic how he could write like that. Um, this week's cryptid has no original discovery date that I could find. It's humanoid in appearance. It lives in Central Asia and is still seen today. Do you have any guesses of what it could be? Could you tell me the appearance again? Because I zoned out because I was looking up Patrick Rothfuss books. It, it He did Name of the Wind, um, but books no, one no. and two, and then the Princess series, which is the adventures of Princess and Mr. Whiffles. Yeah, um, I see this. Yeah, it's fantastic. You can see him doing a live reading on YouTube. Um, so it's humanoid in appearance. A lo- uh, uh, It's a hairy humanoid biped that lives mm-hmm. in Asia. Is still seen. And I couldn't find an original discovery date. Well, I mean, if we're talking about Asia, there is the Yeti, but I don't think that that's what you're talking about. I'm I'm not. Can you think of any other Asian Bigfoots? Uh, Sun Wukong. No, but I love that movie. Oh, man. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know which one oh. it's. It's hard. It's hard with uh, humanoids because there's so many of them. There are so many of them, and they're basically uh, all variants on Bigfoot. They are. Today we're talking about the Almas. That sounds familiar to me. Yeah, it, it was a big one. There used to be a lot of um, things about it on uh, TV and media, and then th- in recent years you haven't heard as much about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's a reason. 
<laughs> which we might get into later. Uh, Ooh, so the Almas. What? Which band? There's a band. I googled the Almas, and a band popped up. Oh, okay. So, and I just said I googled uh, my Google thing, like my OK Google. Yeah. Uh, thing popped up. So there's that. Oh no. And then it popped up again when I said OK Google. <laughs> so I'm having fun. Continue, oh yeah. Though. The Almas or Alma translates from Mongolian to wild man. It is a purported humanoid uh, cryptozoological species uh, reputed to inhabit the Caucasus and Pamir Mountains of Central Asia and the Altai Mountains of Western Mongolia. It is considered to be more akin to uh, wild people in appearance and habits than the uh, Yeti and apes uh, in contrast. So it's more of a human-sized kind of hairy wild guy. So it's kind of like the thing that I talked about that looked like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what the, was that? The Polish wild man? The Polish wild man. Yeah. Yeah. The Almuses are typically described as human-like bipedal animals between five and six and a half feet tall. Their bodies are typically covered with a reddish-brown hair, and they have anthropomorphic facial features, including a pronounced brow ridge, a flat nose, and a weak chin. Sounds like Henry Zabrowski. Sounds like Henry just running through the Asian mountains. So basically, Woo! basically, yeah. if Ben Kissel is the Bigfoot, and then Henry Zabrowski is the Almas. He is the Almas, yeah. <laughs> okay, got it. I think that I think just normal Henry running through the mountains is uh, a little bit more scary than. Uh... <laughs> I, I honestly think normal Henry running through anywhere is a little more scary. Yeah, <laughs> because he channels he channels this level of he has this like je ne sais quoi to him. Yeah, no, that... it's pretty fantastic. It's I mean, I love the dude. It's just he's he's <laughs> next level. Oh yeah. Uh, many cryptozoologists believe there is similarity between these descriptions in modern reconstructions of how Neanderthals might have appeared. Well, okay. When you say many cryptozoologists believe... Okay, continue. <laughs> in 1420, a then 40-year-old traveler named Johann Schlittberger wrote in his journal about these creatures... Uh, during a time he was captured by the Mongols. Schlitberger. <laughs> it sounds like the like like that sounds like a brand new thing. That <sighs> Schlitberger sounds like it's that new burger place that opened up on Main Street, and you're just like, is it good? Schlitberger sounds like it's a burger joint, but they also come with like you can get a. Uh, a bottle of whiskey and a brown paper bag with it. Mm, yeah, no, it definitely sounds like it sounds like a place that exclusively caters to alcoholics. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We'll we'll get the new uh, the the Schlitt burger is a triple bacon cheeseburger, and it also comes with uh, uh, really twenty four ounce of of hot beer at Schlitt yeah. burgers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he writes. I was one of five Christians who went with him into the Great Tartary, first through the country uh, called Strana, then through the country called Gersi. After that, he passed through a country called Lakinshan. Then he traveled through a monstrous country called Setzulit, uh, where there are many Christians who have a bishop there, and their priests belong to the Order of the Shoeless. Now, two items ah. of note, there was a... A ton of uh, other stuff that he had. I edited all of it out. The point yeah. is, this guy traveled. They went a distance. Yeah, I noticed I noticed that there's a lot of ellipses in there. Yeah, basically every time there's an ellipsis, just imagine I redacted almost a full paragraph because yeah, it is describing the countries. I'll believe that. I've read, I've read literature from the 1400s for this podcast. <laughs> I know what it's like. Yeah. <laughs> I know what it's like. That's why whenever I do a modern cryptid, I'm happy because usually there's an article that has like links to newspaper articles I can read and, you know, it sums it up nicely and, you know, it's, it maybe takes me an hour to read everything. Whereas 
when it's the 1400s, it takes me an hour to read one one source. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah. <laughs> also, mm-hmm. I noticed you have a question mark next to Christians. Um, oh no, that was so that was in the translation of the original article. Okay. Um, they did that sort of thing where they add in brackets words that they believe uh, should be there for context but weren't written. You see that okay. in, in like modern newspapers and stuff where someone's just talking, mm-hmm. and then you see if you're reading the written transcription, the, uh, if they insert a word that might have been dropped, but put it in brackets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because it's a part of like the way that Hebrew speaks and all that. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, okay, gotcha. Yep. Uh, I did try to find more uh, about the order of the shoeless, but I had no luck. The first hit is a bar called Shoeless Joe's where someone named Tammy uh, said the Noki was slimy. Isn't Noki generally slimy? Uh, maybe I'm thinking of something different. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's generally a little it's a little slimy, right? Like, y- Yeah, but Tammy didn't like Shoeless Joe's Noki. Well, well, maybe Tammy, maybe Tammy doesn't understand what, what Noki is. <laughs> I'm looking up Shoeless Joe's right now. Are you? I want to okay. see what their logo looks like. That's, I don't know that they have a logo. Do they have a logo? That they do. It's a sports. It's a sports grill. Yeah, it's thirty locations. Uh, they have a three-pound order of wings. Oh God. Um, they're called dusted wings, which uh, it has it has four thousand six hundred and ten calories in it. Oh man, that's like two days worth of food in one one like yeah i wouldn't recommend that no i wouldn't recommend it either like wait one sec how much is this how much is this menu item i'm on their website (laughs) oh are you on their website yeah i need to know uh dusted this is a great bit (laughs) yeah. <laughs> oh, most of it's going to be cut down. <laughs> uh, $45. For oh. Wings. Holy crap. Which, uh, hmm. I mean, we're talking about about a buck a wing. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't know if I'd spend $45 on 40, 50 chicken wings. Because here's the fact of the matter. That's too many chicken wings. That's too many chicken wings. You can't enjoy them properly. You cannot enjoy them properly. No, because they're going to... The problem is they're going to get cold by the time you get to the end of them. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's probably for, for groups of people, but I'm not going to get... <laughs> I'm not going with a group that's going to eat 50 chicken wings. Well, I do know a few people who are big eaters. Yeah, so. I was going to say, we, we could probably go with with another person that would eat 50 chicken wings. <laughs> yeah, we, we've got... We, we know enough people. We could probably throw together yeah. uh, the chicken wing eating party. Yeah. <laughs> now, the son of the above-named King of Tartary, and who was named the Zegre, uh, had come to Edigi. Um Again, my pronunciation on this, who knows? Um, that sounds went, about right. Yeah. He went uh, with him to the above-named country of Isabur, and they traveled for two months before they arrived there. There's a mountain in that country, which is 32 days' journey in extent, the people there themselves say that the extremity of the mountain is a desert, uh, and that the desert is the end of the earth. I mean, basically. Uh, yeah. Uh, they also said that the same desert, uh, nobody can have a habitation because of snakes and wild beasts. And the Mongolian uh, death worm. And the Mongolian death. It's entirely possible. Um, and was, the dragon. And the dragon. <laughs> that one dragon. <laughs> Never forget about the he, dragon. He's a dick. He he won't kill you. All he does is he he. If you bring water, he just knocks it out of your hand. Mm-hmm. He's kind of a jerk. Yeah. Uh, uh. On the same mountain, there are savages who are not like other people, and they live there. They are covered all over the body with hair, except for the hands and face, and run about like other wild beasts in the mountain. They also eat leaves and grass, and anything they can find. The lord of the country sent to Ed. Edigi, uh, a man and a woman from among these savages that had been taken in the mountain. Uh, so, I'm reading this. Yes. Well, you're reading this, and I'm listening and reading. Um, 
how is this any different from any description that like European explorers oh they're all the same they all they all sound like this anytime they're describing a native tribe i feel like yeah they all write the exact same way like i i i bet you i i i mean this is conjecture Mm -hmm. i don't have proof but i bet you i could find them talking about someone talking about like native americans this way oh you could probably find an explorer talking about anyone in this way that this is just how they write those damn germans those damn germans um but yeah so like i'm not like this this description one it's yeah. very biblical first of all. yeah well that, it's it's it, that old writing they, yeah they, none of it flows well this is one of those things where if i saw something like this in modern times i'd be like oh they're trying to bury the lead yeah right they're yeah. trying to hide the fact that this is a thing they're they're deliberately being roundabout in their language yada 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 the mm-hmm. fact that this is in 1420 makes me realize oh they're just copying the bible <laughs> it's entirely possible i mean it's like the only thing they read that yeah. then so yeah and garfield yeah it's weird that garfield was around in the 1400s when it started in like the 80s yeah but i mean when when the uh, when Garfield Collection twenty three fell through the, that time portal, it really screwed everything up, didn't it? That would be fantastic to see, <laughs> like wood carvings of Garfield, <laughs> or even better, Garfield minus Garfield. Oh my god! You know what? <laughs> Here's the thing: if if I ever got access to a time machine, yeah, because of the notion of causality and all that stuff. I've I probably wouldn't change the course of history that much, which sounds like a really shitty thing. But like, once you start mucking about in history, things get mucky. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably advance the the um, the technology that created the Shamrock Shake. Um, That's but fair. outside of that, I'm not sure how much I would do. I'd probably drop an anthology series of Garfield back through the time machine. <laughs> 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 then destroy the time machine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause the, uh... I feel like, I feel like I, w- I would want to see the implications of that on uh, human, like, like humanity. Mm-hmm. Cause think about it. You have modern paper, modern ink, mm-hmm. modern book binding, Modern technology depicted in the book. You know what I would do? I know exactly what I would do. I'd take my time machine mm-hmm. and I would Truman use that to do a Truman Show-esque prank on the band Ludo and make them live Broken Bride. You know, you say that, but there's no, there's no evidence that they didn't get uh, Broken Brided. You're right. A, a lack of evidence is absolute proof. It is. It <laughs> or is. Or at least that's how most of our sources seem to think. <laughs> yep. Oh, uh, yeah. That, by the way, is one of the earliest accounts I could find that described the dietary habits of the Almas, and they uh, appear to describe it as an omnivore. They eat mostly leaves and berries and the such, but they'll eat anything they can get their hands on. Uh, later, a Nikolai Preswalski, a Russian geographer, was exploring a similar region where Johan first heard of the Almas. Nikolai writes that before arriving in Kansu, we heard from the Mongols of some extraordinary animal uh, which ranged through the province and is known to the inhabitants under the name Kung Gurusu, i.e. the man beast. So I want to, I want to take a second. I'm looking at this yeah. image of Nikolai, mm-hmm. Nikolai. Yeah. And he reminds me of someone I can't put my face on. Stalin? finger on it but yes he does that's it that's it it's stalin i just i also just said i can't put my face on it um you're up late you have a cold i I think i have a cold i don't even know anymore (sighs) oh we were told that it had a flat face like that of a human being and often walked on two legs uh, that its body was covered in thick black fur and its feet are armed with enormous claws. That's dope. <laughs> like, that's cool. 
It needs a pedicure. It's also a much uh, uh, better description, and his writing is way easier to read. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. Johan. Yeah. Uh, and that its strength was terrible. And not only were the hunters afraid of attacking it, but that the inhabitants had removed their habitations from those parts of the country in which it visited. These accounts were corroborated by... Um, Tangudans in Kansu, who one and all declared to, uh, to him that the animal answering the above description inhabited their mountains, uh, but that it was rare. When he questioned them if it was not a Blair, a Blair, if ugh, if it was not a bear, they shook their heads and assured us that it was not, adding that they knew well enough what a bear was like. So that comes up a lot encrypted stuff and i've been reading yeah. i actually been reading a lot of like books like just generally about cryptozoology and not about yeah. you know what have you like there's one that i'm reading called like astonishing something or another yeah um, i i posted it to twitter recent ish mm -hmm. um but basically the idea is a lot of a lot of uh cryptozoologists will assume that because there's a story that that instantly means it's based off a real creature. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time, um, a lot of the time it's more or less like myth. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's an, exp I actually am going to get into this on next week's episode, but it's amazing how quickly humans can turn something, you know, weird, but ultimately mundane mm -hmm. into something supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause also, uh, like the Yeti as well mm -hmm. is actually like a name for like the, it's it's like a catch all name for a monster. Gotcha. And a lot of the times it takes the form of a bear because a bear will screw you right up. Yeah. Like, you know, I feel like I feel like as a culture, we underestimate bears. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Bears are uh, like. Uh a lot. I mean, there's a reason that when something is very difficult, people say, oh, that's a bear. Yeah. And that's because bears will fuck you up. They will. They absolutely will. <clears throat> the, um, like, I mean, the next time, if you ever go to a zoo, uh, just, just look at the musculature of those bears. Oh, have you ever seen a hairless bear? Yes. It's a nightmare. It is a nightmare. It is an absolute nightmare. Yeah. Bears are nightmares without hair. They're also hey. nightmares with hair, but that's a whole other thing. They're just general nightmares. Polar bears are scary. Oh, yeah. Well, the other thing is because of their white fur, if you ever see a picture of one, after it attacks something, it's all covered in blood. You're like, oh, that's fucked. There's some metal. They're, they're metal bears. I'll tell yeah. you that much. Oh, yeah. It's not all Coca-Cola drinking, let me tell you. <laughs> they, they they get high on sugar and that's it. Hey, don't do not give a polar bear a Coca Cola. Do don't just don't. <laughs> it it never ends. <laughs> oh, so Nicolay uh, later set a reward for anyone who could show him evidence of such a creature. He was pointed towards a temple that had one on display and promptly concluded. That it was a bear stuffed with straw. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's about right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Russian pediatrician Ivan Evlov, uh, who reported observing uh, an almost family group from a distance of a half a mile, had collected numerous Mongolian stories of interactions with the almas, including reports by Mongolian children that they had played with almas children. And that they were not afraid of them. So is this like the Sasquatch situation where Sasquatch is the name of like a Native American Indian tribe or something like that? No. Because that's kind of what... Yeah. Wow, so these stories are different from a very specific story that, that we're going to get into. Yeah, I'm, I scrolled down a little bit and I'm a little bit befuddled by what I'm seeing. Oh, I'll attempt to give context. Uh, but I don't I think do that's going to be possible. 
<laughs> I, I le- like I'm letting you guys know I legitimately don't think there's any way that this is going to contextually make sense. Because <laughs> based on what you've told me, based on what you've told me so far, this is such a leap from kind of hairy guys to well let let's let, let me let yeah. me not let me not steal your thunder. So. At first, I wasn't going to include this because we, I feel like we talk about them a lot, but I still watched the episode, and it was so crazy that I felt that it should be included. And and what I'm talking about is <clears throat> our friends at Destination Truth uh, friends. beat me to the punch uh, to this uh, yet, creature yet again. And as my other sources are slightly more reputable, uh, I figured... Why not get the modern version of the monster into the Vix before I go into the debunking portion? Yeah. Um, They start by calling it the Siberian Snowman. Unlike the prior descriptions, they claim that it is 9 feet tall and leaves 15-inch footprints and wears animal skins for warmth. So they, they took away the one... They took away the role for Cryptid that Henry Zabrowski could play. Yeah. And then they turned around and said, Hey... Hey, listen, Ben. We know you. We know you have so many Sasquatch rules. Here's one more Sasquatch rule. They completely changed it right off the bat. I mean, they did that for all of them. To be fair, they completely changed the morphology of of every cryptid that they've done. I, I'm beginning <laughs> to think that they're not trying to tell you the truth. <laughs> like I, I'm beginning to think they're just pure ed- entertainment. No, they're it's not even entertainment. They're all business. They 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 get right to work. And to prove that, um, when the show opens, they start by traveling to Moscow, and quickly discover that vendors sell stacks of counterfeit money at booths on the street, okay. and then their cameramen, uh, plural, their cameramen plural break dance in the middle of red square why like why i i that's the thing that that that's not even the thing that got me the most surprised about the the next like couple minutes of this podcast yeah. <laughs> um why are they doing that because like um, i can see the kremlin in the background yeah or not 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 the kremlin that's the royal uh, i don't know the name of the building but yeah 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 it, they... it's the one with the it's the one on tetris so the cameraman put the camera on himself and did say that ever since he was growing up, he wanted to be a b-boy and used to break dance, and that his dream was to break dance at Red Square. So he started break dancing, and then the other cameraman just joined in. Well, you know, like professionals. I, okay. <laughs> so here's here's the thing that's got me concerned. Maybe yes. not concern, but I'm wor- wondering about this individual <laughs> because why why is their dream to break dance in the middle of Red Square? I don't know. That might have been a thing. Uh, I don't like, know. I, I was like, never into like b boy stuff. Like. <laughs> Oh like, man, rapid googling. Like breakdancing on Red Square, Russian March at Red Square, bagpipes and breakdancing in Moscow underground. None of this Red Square dance. Dot. Ko I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, energizing yeah. Red Square dance competition. I guess there's a dance competition. Also. Okay, okay. Wow, that's that's some website <laughs> design. Uh, first launched May 2015, the Red Square Dance Competition focuses on expanding growth chances while motivating dance crews and individual dancers to aim for more professional and higher level perform- in performances. The competition is Red Square's thumbs up response to the dance craze that has seen most young people throughout South Africa using the art form as an outlet to express themselves. Okay, so this is in South Africa, so this is not even remotely related. <laughs> <laughs> to what I was just looking up. Yeah, uh, I couldn't tell you why he this wanted is... to break dance in Red Square. <laughs> this is this is okay. Code and okay. Code ZA. 
uh, okay, there's a there's a square dance club in Moscow. There might have been a group that did like a music video and they danced in Red Square or something like that and inspired him as a child. That's my best guess, though. I, you know I what? Don't... You know what? There was a group that did do a dance in a uh, in Red Square, Brandon. Really? Who was I it? I just found it. I just found it. Um, I believe it was uh, uh, the Russian military. <laughs> oh no! Oh man! This is that. Oh god. Okay. For for a half second, I thought they were gonna just start dancing, but turns out, nope. <laughs> uh, oh. They uh, uh, they then go to <laughs> they then go to the Darwin Museum and speak with someone who claims that they have seen the Almas many times and knows where footprints may be found. They, that was maybe a few seconds. They then fly to Nova Seborsk, uh, where f- all the children have guns. Yep. No, that's normal. That seems like a normal day in either Russia or America. Yeah, yeah. They, they like toddlers. <laughs> like, they've just got... <laughs> you say that, but I, I can guarantee that I've seen Facebook baby pictures. Oh, with uh, guns? Yeah. With guns in our area. Like, yeah. I can guarantee that there are people that we went to high school with who have taken pictures of their children. Oh, with no. That seems irresponsible. Yep. Uh, <laughs> from from there, they go to a train station. Also, these there's I got pictures of all this in the notes. If, if yeah, they're for um, two dollar patrons. Yeah, it's listen. I, I recommend looking at it because, quite frankly. It's slightly upsetting. The middle picture of the children with the guns is probably the most upsetting to me because they, yeah. they have two they have two separate guns akimbo. <laughs> which um <laughs> given the age of that child who can be no more than 10 like yeah. at the oldest um their motor skills are not quite there yet, man. No. And that that's the most concerning part for yeah. me because those are semi-automatic guns. Yeah. Actually, they might even be full auto. I, th- I think looks... I think the one on the left is full auto. Yeah, cuz it does <laughs> look like it has one of those like magazines that that uh just pushes out bullets. Yeah. Who so... knows? Maybe he's the uh, the Russian child Vash the Stampede. <laughs> From there, I, I do believe yeah. Vash had uh, hand pistols and not yes. fully automatic guns. He also had a boot knife that was pretty cool. He also had like a like didn't he have like robotic arms or something? Well, yeah, his one hand was was like could turn into a shotgun because it was a robot, and then yeah. his other hand, uh, his body would transform into like a giant magical laser cannon. Yeah, anime's fun. <laughs> from there they go to a train station um that takes them to barnall then to the bartine mountains okay they meet with a woman who claims to have seen the almas uh they make fun of her cooking okay and then enjoy some tuvian throat singing let's not punch down yeah let's not punch down <laughs> she tells them that if they need to find it they need to go high up onto the mountains and onto a glacier I think they, I think she's leading them on a uh, on a wild goose chase because they made fun of her cooking. I that thought also crossed my mind while watching the episode because they were not nice. <laughs> uh, they don full ice mountain climbing gear and tie themselves together as they attempt to scale what some would call an extremely mild incline. <laughs> yes. Like, yes like i i'm imagining um that scene from oh, from uh from south park where they're like talking about global warming and they all tie themselves yeah. together and like they're way they're way over dressed for it and they all just like pass out three steps yeah. down the sidewalk i would to give no one but you any context the hill um out back of our high school cafeteria was yeah. about twice the steepness of the hill they were attempting to climb. And that was an easy hill to climb. 
Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't want to go up and down it a whole bunch, but, <laughs> like... I think we did go up and down it a whole bunch for, like, endurance training and gym class once. Yeah. Like, once. <laughs> like, it wasn't... So, so I mean, they... they <laughs> just... It was ridiculous seeing it on on the on TV. Night falls, and they surround the area with a sarcastic amount of night vision and thermal cameras. <laughs> like, like this is a in the later seasons, so they had more of a budget, and and they like when it seemed like they put out so many, it seemed like it was a parody of this type of show. Like the 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 extent of which they were like just covering the area. <laughs> So how many? Um, uh, so how many night vision and thermal cameras do you have? Three hundred. Why? What do you mean why? If you yeah. need three hundred, <laughs> yeah. have you ever caught literally anything on any of them? That's why they need three hundred. Yeah. Well, because every time, every time that they don't catch something, they buy another one because they're like, "Well, this one's this one sucked, but we might as well use them. We got them." Yeah. <laughs> Um, now, given the amount of cameras they had, they did find no Amis yet, but in the middle of a uh, a sequence where it was a lot of, like, close-up shaky camera footage where they were doing, like, it, it's clear they were sort of trying to, like, insert some drama where there wasn't any at all. It was more like a, what's that? There's something in the woods shoot, uh, trying to make it look like they seemed something. Their, their demeanor... Their demeanor is very funny. Their demeanor suddenly changes from performing to th- that they, there's fear to real actual fear as they realize that the Almas tracks that they were following uh, became <laughs> several sets of tracks that they quickly realize they are uh, legit in the middle of a wolf pack. Amazing. Uh, they show actual panic and uh, real creatures in the night vision. They, are, they, they were wolves. <laughs> Good. So please tell me that the wolves ate them. <laughs> the wolves did not eat them. But you could, like, it was very funny. Because I was quickly like, oh, what was that? And then, like, quickly, like, he they stop. And you can see, like, they, they're they not breathing when they don't have to. Trying to listen. Their pupils, like, dilate a little. Like, it goes to real fear. Like, they're like, oh, they're like, oh, it's multiple foot tracks. And then they go, oh, shit, we're in, a, we're in the middle of a wolf pack. <laughs> like... Well. <laughs> and then, like, it's a lot of radioing, like, hey, guys, let's everyone get back to base. There's wolves. <laughs> so it wasn't a one-man wolf pack, is what you're talking no, about. No, no, it wasn't a one-man wolf pack. Okay. Uh, they returned to the town and speak with another eyewitness. Her name is Helena. Uh, mm-hmm. She was awoken one night uh, by some sounds, and then she begins to describe what I would call a peeping Tom looking through her window. Okay. Um, so it was probably a peeping Tom, right? That's or... what Mike... She was saying it was the Almas. I'm saying she was just trying... Like, he was outside with his hands up, like, looking through the window at her. And in my head, that's, uh, like, Harry Pervert, not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, uh, cryptid. Mm -hmm. Um, So the team decides to pursue the creature in a tank. Uh, Can you repeat that? Because that... So the team decides to pursue the creature in a tank. Sure. So... There is something I like to say. She wasn't saying I was just awoken by this creature. She was telling a story from the past. So they go to find it in a tank. Uh, I assume this is because you can easily rent Cold War era equipment. And I emphasize it easily easily, uh, because clearly they were not told how easy overheating the engine is and ended up stranded in the tundra and built a snowman while waiting for the tank to, to become operational again. Wow. <laughs> also, that's the single worst snowman I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, it's a real bad snowman. <laughs> like, it's really, really terrible. And it's also hilarious to me that the engine was, let's be honest, so poorly built that it overheated in the tundra. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, 
that's next level poor heat <laughs> management. I feel like. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. And the has... shots they were showing of it driving, it seemed pretty clear that they were doing a lot of like driving as fast as they can and trying to make stuff look cool. And they probably did that for a few hours and then just overheated. <laughs> Very uh... good. <clears throat> They set up eight cameras and a slew of perimeter sensors to try to capture this pervy beast. Um, they, they, that was the end of the show. They didn't find anything. Nice. Um, yeah, that was it. Oh, they did find um, fur when they were out there. And DNA testing uh, proved that it was from an Ibex. Yep. Well, that's so, not surprising to me. Because yeah. I think in that in Siberia, right? That's where they are? Yeah, yeah. There should they, be Ibex they... in Siberia. Yeah. Well, I mean, they found it right before they realized they were, they found basically a slaughter, like a kill site, and then they were, found the wolves. <laughs> it's how that, the timeline for that worked out. Okay, so you mean to tell me that wolves killed probably one of their num- their primary food sources in the area in Ipex, oh, yeah. and they found some <laughs> fur at a kill site of aforementioned Ibex. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it sounds like it could be. It sounds like it could be yeah. an Almus to me. Probably an Almus. The uh, the most famous Almus story is of Zana. This one dates from the 1880s. You're telling me that the Destination Truth story is not the most famous story because it sounds no. like they found a lot of stuff. No, they did not. Uh, I had actually known a little bit about this one before doing the research, mm-hmm. and the following account is paraphrased uh, by the International Center uh, from Hominology uh, from a work by Russian, invest- uh, Russian investigators Igor Burtsev and Dmitry Bayanov and uh, Alexander Meshtonatsev and Boris Por- <laughs> Porshnev. There's a lot so of them. So that's like... That's like the Avengers of Russian sounding names. Yeah. <laughs> like it's as though you got you said, "All right, we need an elite squad. What do we need to do? You have to have the most Russian sounding name possible." Alexander, get over here. Igor, yeah. we need you. <laughs> Dmitri, don't think you're getting out of this. <laughs> oh, Boris, put down that potato and get over here. Yeah, it's just and Boris. He's just <laughs> He, he's not the sharpest one of the Avengers group. <laughs> oh. He's got some borscht. He's got lots he makes, of borscht. He makes, his skill, is, he brings to the table, he makes some good borscht. Surprisingly yeah. good. Like, <laughs> he could probably be a chef. Mm-hmm. But they pulled him away from his work. Yeah, they have they have a seasoning that makes things more bland. Mm-hmm. He's mm-hmm. very good at it. It's yeah. phenomenal. <laughs> oh... They collected uh, over a hundred accounts of mo- local myth of the creature and uh, of the capture and taming of an Almus woman, mm. who surprisingly is credited with having four children by a human father and one son named Quit, who died in 1954. Okay, so she's a human because that's not how anything works. The manner of her capture is vague. Yeah, it sounds like it. Probably she had already changed hands by sale when she came to the property of the ruling prince, D.M. Akba, who uh, was the titular head of the Zadgan region. Well, I think we're going to have to put a human trafficking uh, content warning at the top of this episode, because that's what this is. She passed into the possession of one of his vassals. This is making me feel very gross. <laughs> Named Cello Kua, and she later was presented to a nobleman, Edgi Ganaba, who visited the region. He took her away, still shackled and chained, to his estate to the village of Tikna on the Makva River, 78 kilometers from Sukumi the capital of, of Akbaza. That's a lot of hands that this woman tra- was transferred through. Yeah. Like. I mean, Almus. It's an Almus. Okay. It's an Almus. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm. I I don't agree. I think she's just a woman who's been 
basically trafficked through multiple rich people's hands, but that's just me. No, she's the most famous Almas. Mm-hmm. Or, or she's just, you know, a victim of human trafficking, which seems way more likely. At first, Scannabal lodged her in a very strong enclosure, and nobody ventured in to give her food, for she acted like a wild beast. So you mean to tell me... you? You mean to tell me that a person who's being trafficked doesn't want – reacts negatively towards her captors? I wouldn't say that. I would say she dug herself a hole in the ground and slept in it for the first three years. She lived in this wild state, gradually becoming tamer. After three years, she was moved to a wattle fence enclosure under an awning near the house, tethered at first – but later, she was let loose to wander about. She's literally being treated worse than a slave. However, she never went far from the place where she received food. Yeah, that, this this is uh, this Almas this, isn't being treated well at all. This is horrible. This is like one of the worst things we've described on this podcast. She could not endure warm rooms, and the year round, uh, in any weather, slept outdoors in a hole that she made herself under the awning. I mean, I kind of understand the whole because, like, you can't get snuck up on if you're li- if you're sleeping in a hole. Yeah. Like, if you have a bunch, if you view everyone around you as enemies, generally speaking, placing yourself in a position where you can't be ambushed is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Her skin was black or dark gray, and her whole body covered with reddish black hair. The hair on her head was tousled and thick, hanging mane like on her back she could not speak over the decades uh, that she lived with the people zana did not learn a single akbaz word she so, only made inarticulate sounds and mutterings but were they inarticulate because they didn't understand the human speech that was coming out of her mouth because it's I... an alma who's to say almas versus uh just a person speaking a different language This is making uh, me very upset for this woman. I feel yeah. very bad for Zana. But she reacted to her name, carried out commands given by her master, and was scared when he shouted at her. I mean, if anyone shouted at me, I would be scared too. And this despite the fact she was very tall, massive, and broad, with huge breasts and buttocks and muscular arms and legs, and fingers that were longer and thicker than human fingers. She could splay her toes widely and move the big toe. That's okay. Cool. I There's definitely people, human beings who can do that. And also, wasn't the Almas originally small? Like, we were talking about a Henry Zabrowski type. Yeah. Well, this one's an actual human. Almas. So this is the real, what, how you, the real Almas. The, the, no, what you're saying is this is an actual human. From remembered descriptions given okay. to Masha Tev and... Portionev. Her face was terrifying, broad with high cheekbones, a flat nose turned out, nostrils, muscular jaw, wide mouth, and large teeth in low forehead, and eyes of a reddish tinge. Uh, but the most frightening feature was her expression, which was purely animal, not human. See, Almas. But sometimes she would you... give a spontaneous laugh, bearing those white teeth of hers, and later uh, were so strong that she easily cracked the hardest walnuts. But nothing... Her face... Her description of her face in the picture that's in this makes me think she's just a woman of African descent. Um, That is a real drawing of her in the image up top is of her son. Uh, That's just how the Almas looked, John. But I'm feeling very upset. This this has got me extremely upset. I am super not okay with this. She lived for many years without showing any change. No gray hair, no failing teeth, keeping strong and fit as ever. Her athletic power was enormous. She could outrun a horse and swim across the mild Mekav- Mokva River, uh, even when it rose violent at high tide, seemingly without effort, she lifted with one hand an 80-kilo sack of flour and carried it uphill from the water mill to the village. She climbed trees to get fruit and to gorge herself with grapes and would pull down a whole vine 
uh, growing around the tree. She this ate just, whatever. Yeah. This just sounds like a person who's being made to do a lot of physical labor, so they're good at physical stuff. Yeah. Uh, she loved wine and uh, was allowed her fill, after which she would sleep for hours in a swoon like state. A lot of people like wine. Yeah. A lot of people like alcohol. Yeah. Uh, she liked to lie in a cool pool uh, by the side of buffaloes, and at night she used to roam the surrounding hills. She wielded big sticks against dogs, and on other perilous occasions, she had a curious obsession for playing with stones and knocking one against the other to split them. So she's a geologist. Yeah, she took swims year-round and uh, uh, was naked even the, in the winter. Uh, let's... <laughs> Yeah, sometimes she went into the house, uh, this is but the women a... were afraid and came near her only when she was in a gentle mood. When angry, she presented uh, a scary sight and could even bite, but she made her master, uh, and who knew how to bring her to heal. That's upsetting. Adults used her as uh, a bogey figure with children, although Zana never actually attacked any of the children. Not surprising, because she's a normal human yeah. being who's being, uh, frankly, abused. And treated uh, as subhuman. The Almas was trained to perform simple domestic tasks, such as grinding grain and flour, bringing home firewood or water or snacks uh, from the water mill, uh, or pour, or to pull her master's high boots off. So that's the uh, story of Zana, the most famous Almas. Some additional info um, is that Zana is said to have had sexual relations with a man in the village, uh, named Edgi, Edgi Genaba so, and gave birth to a number of children, apparently human and normal in appearance. Uh, Edgi, isn't Edgi her quote unquote master, though? Like, I'm yeah. literally looking up a couple paragraphs up. Yeah. This is gross. Yeah, th these are from different sources. So one actually tells you what Edgi was, and the other one just says he is a guy from the village. Um, several died in infancy. Uh,. The father, meanwhile, gave away four of the surviving children to a local family. Two boys, uh, Dun Zanda and Quit, uh, uh, two girls, Kadzar and Gamasa, uh, who were assimilated into normal society, married and had families of their own. Zanda died in 1890. Well, she um, was captured in what? Eight, sometime in the 1880s? Yeah. yeah. If I was in a situation where I was... Jeez Louise, that's bad. Yep. So the Jeez. images of, above are of her children. Uh, so the story was real, and she did have children, and uh, there was DNA testing. This one kind of looks like Henry Manzukis. Uh, or not Henry, uh, Jason Manzukis. The, the, the oh, her son quit. Yeah, the one her, son, yeah. her son. Her son kind of looks like Jason Manzukis. <laughs> Brian which is a Sykes, compliment. Which is a compliment, yeah. Uh, Brian Sykes, professor of human genetics uh, at the University of Oxford, has carried out DNA tests on saliva samples taken from descendants of Zana, uh, the so-called wild woman, captured in the late 19th century in southern Russia, who locals believe was the Amnesty Professor Sykes' research um, has yielded a remarkable result, and that is Zana's ancestry was 100% sub-Saharan African. Oh, I'm so surprised. I'm she shocked. She was most probably a, a slave brought to the region by the ruling Ottomans. Yeah, I am shocked. See this? Yep. This is my shocked face. I could have told you that <laughs> just based on the story. It's like beat for beat, like every form of story about sub-Saharan slavery. Except they called her an Almas because, for whatever reason, they were afraid to call her a slave. I think they might have actually thought she was an Almas. It's possible, but that's there. still really which gross. doesn't which one no, does not make anything any better. No, if <laughs> anything, just... it, it makes it worse. Yeah. Um, to answer the riddle and establish what species she belonged to, Professor Sykes had tested samples from six of uh, Zana's living descendants. He has also recovered DNA from a tooth taken from the skull of one of her sons, Quit. Uh, such work is highly specialized, and Sykes was the first geneticist ever to extract DNA from ancient bone. 
Um, but the big surprise in Sykes' uh, results was that Zana's DNA was not Caucasian at all, but African quits tooth sample confirms her maternal uh, African ancestry in the saliva. I'm assuming they're doing it. It's they're talking for maternal ancestry. Yeah. They're talking mitochondrial DNA. Yeah. Um, and the saliva test of the six living descendants uh, show that they all contain African DNA in the right proportions for Zana to have been genetically 100% sub-Saharan African. Huh. That's, that's surprising that, I get, I get why these types of things are done, but at the same time, I feel like it's like almost a waste of good science. <laughs> because just a simple yeah. like me reading that and thinking, okay, uh, what's a ra- more rational explanation for this horrible thing that's happening to this woman? Oh, okay, yeah, probably slavery. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's so gross. Mm-hmm. Uh, the final case uh, is from around 1941, shortly after the German invasion of the USSR. A wild man was captured somewhere in the uh, Caucasus uh, by a detriment from the Red Army. He appeared human but was covered in fine, dark hair. Interrogation revealed his apparent inability to speak and the creature is said to have been shot as a suspected German spy. Okay. So that kind of sounds to me like a hairy Polishman just got uh, <laughs> got caught by the Russians. Because I, if you look at me, I am covered in fine dark hair everywhere. <laughs> and... If I was somehow uh, basically naked in the middle of uh, Russia, I would definitely I mean, that's what be I call ugly. a good Tuesday. Huh? <laughs> that's what I call a good Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes that happens. <laughs> but I would definitely be unwilling to speak. Yeah. They know. Well, especially if I didn't speak the same language. Yeah. I might yeah. just yell at them. Mm-hmm. That might be fun. Yeah. Uh, as far as what the Almas may be, I'm leaning towards uh, Nicolay's findings of a misidentified bear. Uh, he wrote that all the stories we heard were all a pack of fables, and the uh, narrators, after listening to my assurances that the creature was none other than a bear, declared that the Kongersu never showed itself to people, and that the tracks alone were occasionally seen by huntsmen. This bear, whose skin I now saw, stood four feet high, its muzzle protruding, the head of the forepart of the body a dirty white color, and the back darker. The paws were almost black, the hind feet long and narrow, and the claws about an inch long, blunt, and of a dark color. Unfortunately, I could not make uh, more accurate measurements uh, or examine it more carefully for fear of exciting suspicion. Um, this again is the bear back at the temple that they told him was mm-hmm. a, a almas. Um, yeah. The following spring, as we returned from Coconor to the Chabozin, uh one morning uh, on the borders of a forest in Kansu, we saw one of these bears in the wild in, and engaged in catching uh, alpine hares. We went towards it, but it ran off, and although pursued by our dogs, uh, it never turned to bay. We fired several long shots. Uh, after the bear, but only wounded it. And to our extreme regret, it got off. The one of the Ooh. Coco Nor, uh, I don't feel like reading this. Basically, long story short, he saw a bear and it, it was <laughs> the same same bear that was at the temple. So, um, yeah. now, did the bear just get off on danger? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I would I would be extremely regretful if I caused it was that it's to like the masturbating bear from uh, Conan that they used to have, oh, but it, 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 they're hunting rabbits in the forest and then the bear just ran crest of the hilltop, its hands doing things to itself and it just went witness me and then it, it ran off after they shot at it. Yeah, and then uh, and then. <laughs> Then the Coyote Peterson came. Oh, no. <laughs> Watch me steam myself. Yeah. I got a bullet in and I'm not afraid to use it. Yeah. Um, 
I think that these sightings may have been of an adolescent Kamcha bear. Adults stand at 2.4 meters tall, 7.8 feet, Mm -hmm. and the creatures live in the area but prefer coastal regions and may stand or even walk for a short distance on their hind legs and their backs have a small hump. Uh, Europeans were surprised by the number of the bears uh, in this region, and uh, it's not beyond reason that an adolescent might be mistaken for a hominid at they a distance. They also might be mistaken for a Roosevelt. Yeah. <laughs> they got that Roosevelt hump. They got that Roosevelt hump. Mm-hmm. Uh, alternatively, the, the Siberian brown bear may also be a candidate, but it is um, they're, they're closer to the description of a grizzly bear, so they imagine it would be harder to be mistaken as a human. I like the I like the picture of the Kamacha bear you have there. Because he just yeah. looks like, he looks like he's a middle-aged man who's just done with everything. I intentionally picked that picture because like, there's a lot to choose from. That's why I went with it. Because, like, he's he got, went, he, he's just sick of the shit. That's what he tired. looks like. I, I can, I can see myself in that, yeah. in that Kamachka bear. Yeah, like, it's the most human-looking bear. Like, you look at him, and it's clearly, like... He's just done. He's he, just tired. He's sick he gets of this shit. humanity. He understands yeah. us. Yeah. He sat through one too many meetings, too. Yeah. It's okay. The, I know. Uh, so, did you ever read 1984? Of course. So, that room, uh, what was it, room 101, that they, they uh, do all the torture in? Yeah. That, the reason why the torture happened in that room is because the uh, the author w- did work for for the BBC, and that was the room where they had all the meetings. <laughs> so he named the torture room after his meeting room. <laughs> That's not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, meetings are the worst. Absolute yeah. worst, especially if you're in a if you're in a field that has contract work. Mm-hmm. Meetings are the worst thing in the world. Because half the meeting is people arguing about what the contract means. And the other half of the meeting is prying, people trying to weasel out of work because the contract doesn't explicitly say something. <laughs> that's true. That that's, I hate... There's, we have too many meetings. I, I, I just wanted to like, just get work done. I don't like <laughs> this sitting and then arguing isn't necessarily the right word for a lot of it but like going over like all this other tedious stuff where i i much prefer to like give me two weeks i'll do a bunch of work and then let's have a meeting at the end of that and then we'll base our our discussion off of this and see how we can change or modify it to fit the contract or or, instead of all that crap i don't know that calls with customers i hate calls with customers because you can't you have to be nice. Yeah, you do. That like, <laughs> it's unfortunate, but you do. Yeah, because like it, it, the nice thing at, at at work is that you can be. This is going to be the worst end to any episode. <laughs> it's just us, but you have meetings. Long story short, is like you can like have meetings can get very. Uh, uh, once you're out of the meeting room, everyone's back to normal, basically. So it can get like tense. And they, you know, people, you know, people say, it's, you know, that's dumb and, and all that shit. Yes. And yelling at people. I they will like, say it, that. It, I like that. Like, once you're out of the meeting room, you know, give someone five minutes and then you're out of the meeting room and, and it's dumb with you, even if you're, like, had a very heated, uh... <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I never get out of that meeting room. <laughs> Anywho, I, I think that's uh... enough uh, talking about meetings. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So some general plugs. Uh, our website is cryptopediacast dot com. Um, on Insta- think of a worse ending. <laughs> no, there's literally no possible worse ending. We have to end it though, because because no we, we have to end it. But I just can't think of anything uh, worse. Uh, than we we like... literally could not have ended it worse than talking about meetings. Um, also, don't Google Zana the Alma because that's also super upsetting. There's yeah. some very upsetting images on the internet. Um, so let's leave you with that. Uh, yeah. So as I was saying, our website is cryptopediacast.com. All the oh. links that we're about to lay down are there. Um on Instagram and t- Twitter, we're at Cryptopediacast. 
Um, if you want to email us, you can reach us at cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com. Uh, we have a Patreon, which should be in the show notes. Uh, we have a Facebook group. We post a lot of stuff to that Facebook group, mostly uh, us talking about our research, um, me posting whatever terrible internet video I'm watching today. Um, <laughs> If you like the podcast, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and, you know, um, sign any sacrificial contact, contracts you need to get us more notoriety. Um, if you have any monster requests or stories you want to tell, feel free to send them, send them to us at the links we mentioned above. Um, if you have any creepypasta or cryptopasta, I probably won't read it. Um, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon capital C capital B. Um, as always, my Instagram is at mu2057. My Twitter is at JF Dunham. And my now functioning website is johndunhamgames.com. Woo! We got a functioning website again. Yeah, that took forever. <laughs> I, I ended up I, I it took forever that's all I'm going to say um, if you want to email me it's john at cryptopediacast.com there's also a link to that on my website our art was done by Tom Hill you could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill his website is greatergloryco.com and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com as always I'm John I'm Brandon and I'm going to need you to come in on Sunday. <laughs>